Our next speaker is Dr. Vlad Zaha, who is an assistant professor of internal medicine, and he received his initial medical training at Carroll Davila University in Romania. Dr. Zaha completed his internal medicine residency at Indiana University and performed his cardiology fellowship at Yale and University College in London, specializing clinically in oncocardiology and advanced cardiovascular imaging. The title of his presentation is Pet Imaging and Cardiac Stress Testing. Hello everyone, I have no disclosures today and I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to uh, present and uh, my colleagues Dr. Sabramaniam and Dr. Agusala in the Emerging Cardiac Pet Program at UT Southwestern. The objectives today are to help you to understand the role of cardiac PET CT in assessing myocardial perfusion, myocardial flow reserve, myocardial viability, and if we, the time will allow us, uh, a little bit of uh, discussion of the myocardial sarcoid. So first of all, using imaging, and specifically uh, PET-CT in diagnosis of coronary artery disease. And one important concept to um, uh, realize without going too much into the technology is the dual photon nature of the positron emission tomography compared to a single photon emission on SPECT. This allows uh, better detection with coincidence uh, detection, uh, better spatial resolution, uh, better sensitivity, so we can use isotopes with a lower um, half time, and uh, that allows uh, to achieve lower radiation dose. Um, also, it allows us to quantify absolutely uh, the signal. And uh, one factor that comes together with uh, increased sensitivity is the mandatory attenuation correction, as I will show forward. Um, these are the three uh, tracers that are currently approved by FDA. The top two ones, rubidium and ammonia, are for myocardial perfusion. Uh, you may notice the low half-life uh, for both of them, which indicates that the generator or the cyclotron would have to be locally at the site of the assessment. The third one is fluorodeoxyglucose. It is a metabolic tracer that with slightly longer half-life, so it can be delivered regionally and uh, it is used for metabolic studies in the myocardium. So we'll start by focusing on uh, the perfusion, and um, these short half-lives allow us to streamline the protocols, allowing to combine stress and sometimes metabolic imaging in the same study, or if the viability study is involved only uh, using rest and metabolic imaging. So these images are typical for an ammonia or rubidium perfusion study. Um, and they would, uh, I was saying, don't look very different from the usual SPECT images that you're probably familiar with. But what is the difference? The difference is in the high sensitivity and high specificity of the PET study on the left-hand side here. So the accuracy of the study is higher than that of SPECT, shown by multiple studies uh, that uh, are summarized in this slide. So the blue bars represent the increased sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy of PET studies. And I would like to uh, highlight on the top right corner the increased sensitivity for detecting multivessel disease using PET, the stamina white bar. So an example, a difficult case. You have a 58-year-old um, a man with end-stage renal disease, with diabetes, who comes for a pre-op evaluation. So at risk of contrast-induced nephropathy potentially and having to end up on dialysis. So first we perform a SPECT study. And uh, what we cannot tell for sure here is whether the apex and septum have decreased signal. So in the next step, we perform the rubidium PET-CT. And um, it becomes obvious here that there is a combination of defects with a small amount of scar in um, the RCA territory and with significant ischemia in the LAD territory. And this is confirmed by a coronary CT that was performed subsequently with a significant uh, lesion in the proximal LAD and with a totally occluded RCA. 
another tough image, uh, this time coming directly from uh, PET CT. And uh, it is really uh, abnormal with a lot of areas of uh, decreased signal. However, the challenge here is that you cannot probably realize that there, there is no coronary distribution that could explain these images. So what is happening here? Uh, this is a pitfall of the PAT CT. It's, it is a misregistration. And when we analyze these images, we always have to take a close um, look at what is the alignment of PAT and CT. And this is what is happening when we correct the images and we ha register them um, in uh, the indicated fashion. Uh, we have normal perfusion. However, PET-CT is, uh, is a huge advantage, right? Combining these two methods um, raises the sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy from 90 to, 90, 90 to 92% for each method in turn to 98%. So um, this is an excellent study. We'll move next to the risk stratification. And um, in this case, what we are interested in is to understand in more detail uh, what is the blood flow through the myocardium. And the blood flow through the myocardium is a combination of the stenosis of the epicardial arteries, uh, diffuse atherosclerosis, or microvascular dysfunction. So therefore, the assessment becomes sensitive, but is not necessarily specific for epicardial coronary artery disease. By combining resting and uh, hyperemia um, quantitation, we can derive a coronary uh, flow reserve as a fraction of the two. So looking at um, cohort data, uh, we, we observed that the myocardial perfusion reserve um, at low values correlates with a high probability for three-vessel disease. So that's, that's very important. In uh, several studies, we also find that the coronary flow reserve at low values correlates with high mortality. In a study of 2,783 patients where the coronary flow reserve was measured and uh, the patients were then categorized into three tertiles, the lower tertile with less than 1.5 um, uh, coronary flow reserve was having a 5.6 higher risk of um, cardiac mortality compared to the lower tertile. Another area that's important is what do we do with the intermediate risk patients? So if you focus only on the, on the middle part of this graph, you will notice that an intermediate category of 32% um, based on a pre-coronary flow re uh, reserve risk can be then successfully categorized into low risk, 34% of it, and 17% would be in fact high risk. So there is value to this uh, reclassification. Uh, there is another importance for coronary flow reserve um, calculation in uh, case of a really very prevalent disease like uh, type 2 diabetes. And I would like to attract your attention to the red and blue bar on the right side, which correspond to the curves on the graph uh, that represent the annualized cardiac mortality in patients who have type 2 diabetes and have a low coronary flow reserve uh, versus a high coronary flow reserve. So in summary for this section, the coronary flow reserve allows us to um, assess the, the risk uh, with the low risk if um, there is a high coronary flow reserve and uh, dramatically accelerated uh, risk if there is a decreased coronary flow reserve regardless of the method or model used. And this uh, would allow us a more appropriate risk certification. So uh, it is a complex method that's based on um, uh, software development and is prone to some artifacts. But now if we move to the guiding and management, um, it, um, it is a combination of the different methods that I just presented. So the more myocardium, ischemic myocardium we identify, the higher the risk of um, uh, mortality and uh, um, as another factor is um, the viability of the muscle. So the death rates increase as uh, we maintain viable myocardium and not reperfused. 
And this brings the concept of using a multi-parametric analysis where we are looking in this case um, at um, plots of resting perfusion, stress perfusion, and then on the third um, graph, uh, viability, which is in this case uh, the FDG signal. So we see that the entire myocardium is able to maintain my uh, metabolic activity without having perfusion in this state. So this would be a situation where there is benefit from, for reverse colorization. And uh, this results in a, in a new paradigm where, um, as in the previous uh, graph looking at ischemia, there may be an intersection point between deciding between medical therapy and early reverse colorization. And um, the viability concept also uh, would explain why there is an additive effect between uh, the degree of ischemia and the degree of uh, coronary flow reserve on this three-dimensional graph. Another important aspect is the disparity between genders, and uh, the cardiovascular risk in women um, it is, uh, can be identified in a different profile of coronary artery disease where we do not have uh, a lesion in the epicardial coronary artery disease that can be addressed readily. So there is a diffuse atherosclerotic disease with increased cardiovascular events uh, where um, much more attention has to be paid to, to treatment. So in summary, regarding quantitative um, coronary flow reserve, it is a power tool, powerful tool um, adjunct to semi-quantitative analysis uh, of uh, myocardial perfusion uh, imaging. It helps to identify truly low-risk patients, especially at, at risk populations. And uh, there is a role in selection of patients for revascularization and outcome uh, that needs further investigation. Uh, just to bring a, a point regarding the viability, uh, these are examples of different uh, patterns. It is mostly valuable in patients with left ventricular dysfunction due to coronary artery disease that are eligible for a revascularization and have a resting myocardial perfusion defect. On the top, you can see the, an example of a mismatch, which means hibernation, which is in the um, apex and anterior wall. And uh, the two lower panels are showing two different patterns of scar, a complete a lack of perfusion and metabolism, and a partial defect on both, uh, but that are proportional. So cardiac sarcoid imaging, in the next two minutes, I will just bring a, few, uh, a, a new concept. Uh, this might affect some of your young patients with no coronary artery disease, but presenting with tachyarrhythmias, low uh, ventri LV um, ejection fraction, or heart block. We are using a special protocol where we are minimizing the glucose uptake by normal myocardium using fasting for 12 hours and high fat and low carbohydrate diet. And what we achieve by that is accumulation of uh, glucose in uh, inflammatory tissue that um, causes the uh, sarcoid granulomas. Um, so this method is, is highly sensitive at detecting early disease, and it can detect the natural progression of disease uh, with uh, higher signal in, in progressive and peak stage disease, and then decreased signal as the inflammation is replaced by fibrosis. It is a very good method with a high sensitivity and uh, high specificity. And uh, looking at the sequence of, um, of scans, so we can also um, look, you may notice here pulmonary involvement on uh, planar views, but then using PAT, we can identify specifically the areas involved. Uh, this is an example of sarcoid in the basal to mid anterolateral wall. And uh, the important parameter to consider is that uh, this type of imaging can be used to assess effect of treatment. So in conclusion, uh, the cardiac PET uh, for, for sarcoid is a valuable tool to diagnose cardiac sarcoidosis. Perfusion viability images improve the accuracy and they're critical to combine here. And the therapy response can be assessed. Thank you for your attention.